summertime tips and fun facts from Paul, Kristen, and Dexter at Total Wine More. For grilled wings, bring on the barbecue sauce. Pair with Syrah to make your taste buds hop. It's a great time of year for strawberries in a salad. Enjoy with a crisp cider for a perfect pairing. Nothing beats recommending a great wine. And with our extensive selection, I can help find the perfect one for your budget. Whether you're hosting or just bringing the wine, Total Wine & More has you covered with 8,000 wines, 3,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers at always low prices. Cheers! It's a beautiful night. Tonight, our favorite show is She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, brought to you by the good people at DreamWorks Animation Television, Mattel Creations, and Netflix, and NBC Universal Television Distribution. Uh, I am your host, the Mandated Reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge, and joining me to talk about She-Ra and the Princesses of Power Season 2 is the one and only proprietor and owner of the Honeysuckle Rose Creations, Mrs. Alexis Haina. How do you do, madam? I am doing very well, but don't start singing that song unless you're going to sing the whole thing. (laughs) <laughs> well, I happen to have a plate of spaghetti and meatballs in front of me and no one to share it with, so I guess I won't sing the song. Well, I've um, got a couple of on hand. Are you going to get Disney Plus when that comes out? Oh, totally. Okay, me and you may have to then do a, a, a TV party for the live-action Lady and the Tramp, which is debuting on uh, Disney Plus when, uh, when that finally lands. I'm torn between thinking that's going to be awesome and thinking that that is going to be Lion King meets Snow Buddies. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it's going to be good. I'm just saying we have to talk about it. Yeah. No, Lady and the Tramp is one of my... I How do I put this? One of my, I'd say, top ten understated favorite Disney films. It's funny. We're like not even a minute into this and we're already talking about something else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you brought it up. <laughs> I, I, I did bring it up. I'm, I'm bad. All right. Um, that with, with that being said, let's uh, let's get on with Shira season two. Now we discussed Shira season one, and the whole reason we started on this, other than Alexis is my go-to gal uh, for all things cartoony, uh, but also this made news for its uh, gay positive approach on despite the fact that it is a children's cartoon show they really went out of their way to do uh, you know a couple of things here it actually won, it was actually nominated for a glad media award for outstanding kids and family programming and so we were like okay let's see what's so gay positive about this let's let's see what the you know what it's all on about you know um, there's an entire section dedicated in the wiki page for uh, LGBT representation so we, that was what, a lot of what we discussed in the first season. Uh, and then we decided to stay with it because, you know what? That's not, you know, it, that's that's certainly a piece of the show. But I don't think it's what the show is, is about. And I don't even think it's the best parts of the show. The best parts of the show are in the characterizations and the writing. And there's a lot of fun stuff going on with she So we opted to stick with it. Not to mention the fact that it's one of the few shows me and my daughter can sit down and watch. Uh, we, me and her, binged this uh, this past Saturday, 
And, uh, you know, it was only seven episodes long. They're taking the approach to this as they did with Voltron, where they're now, you know, cutting the seasons in half, you know, doing one half in the first part of the year and the next half in the latter part of the year. So they haven't had an announced date yet for, quote unquote, season three, but I suspect it'll be around December. In any case, uh, what did you think overall the first seven episodes here, season two? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I did enjoy them, but I felt that there was a lack of ambition with season two. There was definitely some great writing, some really funny lines, definitely some character development, but it didn't feel as ambitious as the first season. We didn't get a massive, you know, season ending. What's the word that you kept using in our end game review? Moz? Yes. Yes. Where does that word come from? Uh, it's a wrestling term. And, oh. it, you know, um, so. Uh, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels uh, Survivor Series 97 match was supposed to end in a schmoz, which is that Davey Boy and Owen Hart was supposed to run down, then Triple H and China would run down, and there would be this gang brawl. So another way of saying, you know, massive multi-person brawl is schmoz. How do you spell schmoz? S-H-M-O-Z-Z? Um, one Z. One Z. One Z is plenty. Okay. okay. I'm posting that on Facebook. Tonight, I learned the definition of schmoz. <laughs> well, eventually, you'll get, you hang around with us long enough, and you'll get, to, uh, you'll get to hear all the wrestling terminology. You'd think I'd pick up enough of that, having lived with Sean Comer as long as I did. <laughs> but, yeah, like I said, I, I, I don't know. It was good, but I felt a little underwhelmed. I, I guess I was kind of expecting some big massive reveals or a big massive battle or something so good but i definitely enjoyed the first season more so right off the bat i gotta share my two favorite lines of this season and i sent them to you so that i would remember them later and so here they <laughs> are the first one this the first one goes goes to the episode roll with it and you know it's the great thing about the one of the themes of this season is adora struggling with uh, being the best She-Ra that she can be and being better than the previous She-Ra and putting all of this pressure on herself and coming to the realization that she does not have to go insane trying to be the best She-Ra she can be. She just needs, you know, she needs to relax and, you know, and do what comes natural. Um, and she sort of figures that out over the course of seven episodes but it comes to a head and roll with it where they're trying to figure out what's the best assault on this uh on this base on this castle and what's great about this episode other than this is yet another voltron did a D, &D episode it was one of our favorites this one's up there um where they're not necessarily playing D, &D but they're strategizing using miniatures and, and essentially and you know and like a D, &D map and so uh, it's more like a game of risk yeah, something along those lines. Risk or Stratego. Strate is it Stratego or Stratejo? I, I, I uh, it's Stratego. Stratego. Okay. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard some people pronounce the G as a J for some reason. Um, and so one of them, uh, so they each kind of take turns uh, narrating their own approach to this. And everyone sort of focused on this as a game and not an actual strategy. And when it's Bo's turn, he, you know, he has himself painted as the big hero and in his, there's a lot of punning going on. So at one point he's fighting Catcher and he says, it looks like I've got you, meow. Dude, I almost died laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, so funny to me. Like, like going out of their way to be really punny. I'm like, you know, you know, like, look, we all know that's kind of my sense of humor. I've made enough bad jokes on these podcasts. But to see, to see it in, the, in she -Ra, I nearly pissed myself. Oh, that episode, like I mentioned, nearly killed me because in Bo's flashback, we get all the characters dressed in their 1980s uh, design. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Like I said, just seeing the, the version of Catcher we know now with that heavy eye makeup and cape from her 1980s incarnation. That was great. And, and all of a sudden having that, yeah, seductive voice. I don't know if that's seductive, but that, that, that specific Catcher voice. He's like, Ooh, yeah, right? like that. Oh my god, that that killed me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of like a play on Catwoman from the '66 Batman show. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other one I like, and I'm not really sure which episode. This might be like the North Pole episode. Might be a different one. 
but there's a a line <laughs> you don't know you don't understand the forces you're mess you're messing with and Entrapta yells out, I know, that's the fun of it. <laughs> okay, no doubt Entrapta does get the best character development, I think, out of anyone else in the series. Yeah, that's a great I place to actually start. Is Entrapta has this really like crazy arc, you know, because they introduced her kind of late in the first season, and then she had, you know, she gets this bit where because you know, and and she even says it in this season, you know, my first loyalty is to science, and so it doesn't really matter if she's working, you know, in her mind, you know, she's sort of chaotic neutral. Um, to to use the D and D parlance. Uh, <sighs> And I know you know what that means, you know. Um, oh, I, I may not be a wrestling ner- nerd, but I am a D and D nerd. <laughs> so I mean, uh, um, I I would say I would have to say like her alignment is definitely chaotic neutral, and essentially mm-hmm. she's aligned herself with the Horde because they're giving her the first one's technology to mess with, and that's all she cares about. There's no, th- there's no black and white with her. There's no uh, conception of good or bad. Good is technology, bad is not technology, and that's where her, you know, and, and so her her loyalty is to that. Like, you know, there's a scene where, um, and I thought this was great, actually, where Hordak is, tr- is building a machine to create portals, uh, because essentially we're, we're going to take, you know, we're going to take the plot right out of the Avengers, and... <laughs> You know, oh yeah, the Avengers were the first ones to do that. Not the first, but certainly one of the most memorable of recent times. Fair enough. So he's building portals, and clearly this is to, to move uh, forces across the internet, internet around the uh, the universe with ease. And uh, of course, his machine dies on him the first time, and then she fixes it. And she has no, and she has no care in the world as to what he's doing with it. She just fixes machines she builds machines she creates machines that's what she does um and of course she starts to earn the loyal the uh the trust of Hordak because of that but yeah she um she's just she's one of the most interesting characters of season two the scene where she breaks into Hordak's lair has got to be one of my favorite moments because he comes in and there's this girl that he, he I, I, I'm assuming he knows of Entrapta. He knows that she's part of the part of their crew or whatever, but he doesn't really know anything about her. He walks in, she's you know bent over his machines working, and he just kind of you know taps her on the shoulder, and anyone else would freak out. It's like oh god, I just got caught by like the the most like the boss the evil lord oh god and she's like yeah yeah wait a minute i'm busy she had <laughs> no concept of how screwed she would be if that machine didn't work i mean the fact that he's like there will be dire consequences doesn't even phase her she's like oh by the way i fixed your machine you're well whatever she, she doesn't care it's so funny i love it yeah it's good stuff and she it's it's really weird because like you know they spent a lot of, you spend a lot of time with Bo and um, oh gosh what is the name of the character Glimmer yeah Glimmer in the first season obviously you spend a lot of time getting to know Adora I feel like they pulled away from that this season I mean you get to know Bo a little bit more especially towards the end of the season with the two dads episode but there was definitely a lot more focus on Catra and Entrapta and uh, slightly less on Oh, pinchy. Um, Scorpi- Scorpina? Scor- Scorpia? Scorpia, that's the girl, yes. Um, but I actually thought that, that, that that's what made this season a little bit more interesting, and I thought it was forward-thinking for the writers to go, okay, we have our good people, we have our good guys established, let's go ahead and focus a little bit more on the Horde and flesh them out so they're not just you know, video game bad guys, you know, bosses of the week, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'll give you that. I do like the character development, although I it's apparent that with Scorpion... Is it Scorpia or Scorpion? I gotta look it up. Scorpia. Yeah, apparently with Scorpia, they're going the Lyra Bon Bon way of establishing that relationship. <laughs> it's a bit, a bit awkward. Um, well, okay, I was like, did, have you, do you... You have a little girl. Has she watched My Little Pony Friendship is Magic? Oh, uh, of course she has. Okay, so you, and there's two. So you got two background characters, Lyra and Bon Bon, who are always seen doing stuff together. And the 
the sh- the shippers are nuts with these two. <laughs> you know, it and there's this great episode. The the 100th episode actually has them uh they're like decorating a town hall or whatever for an event and they're talking about it and they're they're giving each other total bedroom eyes and like it's like it's so great having a best friend like you and it's like yeah best friend world biggest quotation marks <laughs> so every time i see someone so with scorpia i i look at her and she's like you'll see that i'm her best friend i'm like wow that is the lyra and bon bon situation so bad it's it's like, almost it's, uh it, God, it's almost aversive isn't it you know because i think if your dream works in your Netflix, you want kids to watch this. I don't. I would. I would imagine they're not necessarily betting on thirty and four year old adults with podcasts to give this thing a whirl. They're really wanting kids to watch it in mass. You know, they're looking. For, they're looking for my for my girl, my daughter. You know, as an audience member, and I, I got to imagine in the writers' room, there's somebody pushing. You know, there's somebody really pushing the boundaries of gay representation, and there's another person pushing back, going, "We don't want to scare away the children because the parents see what's going on here and turn it off." Yeah, more or less. So, like I said, they're Lyra and Bon Boning it. Yes, they're the, they're not going to actually come out and say, you know, gasp, shudder, you know, gay. So. <laughs> Lyra and Bon Bonning it. But then at the same time, you got to season with the two dads at the, because we find out that Bo was raised by two, by uh, a uh, homosexual parent. So he has two, he has two dads who are two of my favorite characters in the season. They are so adorable. I love them. Yeah. I, uh, I thought that was a pretty brave choice to put that in an animated children's show, but they, hand, they, they also handled it well. I mean, you know, I don't want to get off on a, on a tangent here, but my wife is uh, against a lot of gay representation in children's fair. Otherwise, she doesn't care. She doesn't, you know, she's fine with whatever. And she certainly doesn't have any biases against uh, homosexuals. But she does kind of draw a line at give Elsa a girlfriend, essentially. <laughs> well, we've talked about this on past shows. I'm against the whole give Elsa a girlfriend, not because I'm against the idea of gay characters in children's animation. You know, I'm fine with that. I am against taking an established character and making them homosexual to please an agenda. If you want to start with a gay character, or if you want to get a character, start with the gay char- or the character right. gay the beginning. Yeah, don't we, make we, them gay to please people. Yeah, we had this conversation on the Civil War podcast. I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to it, but there was we did a whole sidebar on the all new all different marvel which was essentially where they race swapped and gender swapped everybody and um you know we were all kind of in agreement with the same sentiment we're not we're, we're fine with what you know you want to have uh, asian and black and female and you know you want to have a slew of minority characters try creating new ones not gender swapping or race swapping established ones that you know that that are you know that are already out there um, though I, I, though it's funny, just as an uh, an aside aside, I, uh, gosh, who was it? Oh, I want to say it was maybe the fan four stick or uh, something else where I got I got really agitated at a at a at a race swap, and uh, I happened to say it in front of my one of my really like super progressive. Uh, like ultra liberal friends, and she like went off on me about it. Oh gee, well, <laughs> with all due respect, you can say whatever you want about Fan Forstick because that is probably <laughs> the worst comic book movie. That, that's Halle Berry's Catwoman. Yeah, <laughs> that which is a work of art. Um, <laughs> yeah, that that needs to be studied. It's so bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I was going on about about, about uh, Michael uh, Johnson's um, Human Torch. Michael Jordan. It's Michael, Michael B. Jordan. M- Michael B. Jordan. Sorry, Michael B. Jordan's Human Torch. And yeah, she went off on me about it, and I was like, "But the char- you know, the the character has always been Caucasian, and the, I'm fine with you know." 
I'm fine with there being, you know, uh, black superheroes, but why are we taking an established character and race swapping him? And she was like, "What? You know, it would. It's it's the it's always the same argument. Why can't he? Why can't why can't we do you know a variation of race and whatever with with all these characters? Um, because none of it means anything. That's essentially the, the counter argument. See, I actually didn't have a problem with uh, casting a black guy as the human torch for that. My problem was that they did that, but they kept his sister, Sue Storm, white. Right. I mean, I, I guess I looked at him like, well, I, I, well, partially just because I like Michael B. Jordan. Anyone who's seen Black Panther knows he's a good actor. And I like it. Anyone who's seen Creed knows he's a great actor. Yep. I liked him in so Creed, I, liked him in Black Panther. So I had no problem with them being cast. My, I basically said, so why can't you also cast a black actress to play Sue Storm? Because I felt that keep, keeping her white and making black was sending more of a statement than if they had just made the whole Storm family black. Yeah. The statement is Hollywood loves hot blondes. Kate Mara is what you would call hot? Seriously? Well, <laughs> this isn't about my personal taste. This is about the message Hollywood is sending. Fair enough. Um, but getting back to getting all the way back to uh, to Shira, yeah, my um, I was I was surprised to see the two the, the two gay dads there and and how they were portrayed. They were portrayed like super positively, and it definitely plays into the you know it definitely plays into one of the things the show is trying to do. But on the like I said, on the other hand, kind of. I kind of thought about my wife in the back of my head who's just like, you know, I don't want to have to explain homosexuality to my kids. Like, can't can't this be something that they experience when they're older and can figure it out? Why, you know, why does an eight-year-old have to see something like this? Look, and she's entitled to her opinion. Um, I, I it's, But that, that, that's what made me kind of surprised by it was I'm sure there were other parents who, if they saw it, kind of had a similar reaction. Possibly, I, I, I'm one of the few people on this show that doesn't have children, so I, I guess I don't really get to have a voice on how to, how you would go about doing that. Because right. I could just be like, oh, we'll just explain to them. I don't have kids. I've never had children. I don't think I really get to stand on the same level as that. So. Well, look, you're, you're safe with me. I'm the guy that watched an episode of the of Orville in front of my kids, and this is the one where Bordas got addicted to porn. So, <laughs> you know, and then, and, and then had to try to explain what it was we were watching because I didn't realize that's where the episode was going. And I'm like, Ugh. funny aside about that, my son, the only thing he picked up about that episode was the way that uh, the Mocklins divorce each other. And the Mocklins are a, a purely uh, male homosexual race. Mm -hmm. well, I, that is how they are. That that is how they they were written. They've since decided to go go back against that now and introduce female Mocklins, but that's a whole other side story. Um, the way that the way that Mocklins divorce each other is by stabbing each other. <laughs> Didn't Steph McFarlane already make that joke in an episode of Family Guy? Oh, it's entirely possible. Um, in seventeen seasons <laughs> again. What, what did I say on the last show? You had me on. Like <laughs> Steph McFarlane's got an original joke in his body. <laughs> right. So one, so one Mocklin stabs the other Mocklin, and then like a few days later, my my son goes, "Hey, Dad, remember when we were watching the show where the one guy stabbed the other guy? That was great." I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hope you save it up for those therapy bills. <laughs> no, we're just gonna. He, he wants to be a police officer. He'll be fine. All right, oh, let's get back. <laughs> let's get back to Shira. Um. So yeah, the 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 the, the gay dads episode with uh, with him, where he you know he's trying to, where Bo is trying to like hide the fact that he's a rebel, and uh, you know they accidentally turn an old, a, a um a first one's machine on and you know and glimmer reveals she's a princess and adora reveals that she's shira and all hell breaks loose it's a great episode i really i love the reaction on the dads when they when uh adora accidentally reveals that she can read the first one's language <laughs> <laughs> she's just so casual about it and they freak out it's so cute <laughs> um we we're uh, we are like drunk driving here. We are all over the road. Were we done with Entrapta? Because uh, I, I just I want to add this at least this much. First of all, she's my favorite character on the show. She's fucking hilarious. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the lady that, uh, that that voices her, Christine Woods, is damn funny. Um, and I thought, you know, the whole... Uh, we actually we didn't talk about this angle yet. That you know, the, when we started off season two, Catra was the uh, the apple of Hordak's eye, but she lo- but uh, she loses favor in his eyes over the course of seven episodes, uh, which you know also we got to talk about Shadow Weaver uh, and, mm-hmm. Entra- and Entrapta ends up pr- uh, becoming you know be- gaining his favor because you know because of her ability to you know create these machines that work and then catcher ends up being jealous of entrapta and you know there's you know and shadow Weaver even warns catcher like you're being you know she's being manipulated but she, you know you're being usurped here and it's like entrapta has absolutely no intentions of doing that she just she just is she you know she's she's such she has such an impish quality to her she's hilarious it is interesting because Entrapta was a member of the uh, the Evil Horde in the 1980s version, so she was always a, supposed to be a bad guy. But again, she's not being a, she's not joining the Evil Horde because she's bad. I mean, I love it when um, oh god, I think it's like the second or third episode when Bo and Glimmer find out uh, that she's okay and she's alive, and, and they get that little uh, voice chat scene. She's like. Yeah, well, the, you know, they brought all my stuff here, and they've got this really sweet text. So I think I'm going to stay here for a while. And they're just like, "You, how do you not see what's going on?" And she's just like, "Whatever." Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. Um. All right. Where do you want to go next? Here, uh, I kind of want to talk about the Shadow Weaver Catra arc because I thought that was interesting, and certainly it ends. You know, we we get uh, a history of Shadow Weaver towards the end of the season, which, of course, ends with the cliffhanger of her standing over Adora's bed after she's escaped because uh, <laughs> Catra got manipulated into letting her out, basically, whether she realized it or not. Um, what did you think of this sort of slow burn towards uh, and what we learned about Shadow Weaver as being sort of a corrupted wizard? I did actually really like that. Um, I liked her design as Light Spinner. I liked the idea of of her being a teacher to others. I like the scene of her fi- of her when she's first introduced to baby Adora and how she's actually pretty caring about her and it's kind of cute. So uh, Shadow Weaver is a character I'm happy we did learn a little bit more about. It's interesting for me that I don't know why I Shadow Weaver's voice always kind of hit my ear wrong. But when seeing her with her um light spinner design it seemed to work maybe there's something about the tone in which she she speaks when she's as light spinner but something about it, it her voice just works better as light spinner than it does as shadow weaver i can't explain it well i think as light spinner she just had the veil in front of her mouth um as uh, shadow weaver she's got this you know presumably metal mask covering her face Maybe in post production, they went out of her way to take Lorraine Toussaint's natural voice and make it slightly tinnier. Yeah, I guess so. Um, that's all I can think of, really. Uh, I uh, yeah, I liked uh, Lorraine Toussaint's performance as Shadow Weaver in this season because I thought the first season she was a little over the top, a little too much, a little too skeletory for me. Mm-hmm. You know, a little tour. You know, Boris Badenoff. Uh, this one, she seemed to have a. This season, she seemed to, you know, while while she's in captivity and she's been humbled and she's trying to figure out a way to manipulate Catra, um, and you know, and get out of there. There seemed to be another level to her that wasn't seen in the previous season where she was the big bad. Definitely. Again, I really did like that's why I. I like the idea that even though she clearly favors Adora, Catra still does not want to harm her. You know, she when she finds out that she's going to be exiled to Beast Island, which, for the record, I am really hoping we see in a, a future season because that just sounds so cool. But I like this idea that Kat, even though again Catra knows that she favors Adora, she doesn't want to see her hurt. It's like it's like the whole wicked stepmother thing. It's like you you know you push me around you meet me but you're the only thing I really know as a parent. So 
help me help you. Um, all right. We're kind of zipping through uh, a lot of this. Uh, one of the... We were talking earlier about the Catra Scorpio relationship, you know, where Catra is. Uh, with each progressive episode becoming uh, more frustrated and um, distancing herself from Scorpio. And there's a great episode with uh, Seahawk where it's like, why are we letting others treat us this way? You know, we deserve better than this. And, you know, you have Scorpion and Seahawk kind of bonding over their mutual uh, sort of mistreatment by others, which I thought was a very funny episode. That was really good. I just like the idea that he's so he's trying to come across as so confident and everything, but he's like, "I'm cool, right, guys? Tell me, I'm cool." At the end of it, he's like, "I don't need your approval." God damn it! <laughs> That's pretty relatable. I think all of us have had a moment where we're very much like Seahawk and Scorpio. We're just wait. We are liked, right? We do have friends. They're not just putting us off. They're not ignoring us. We are. Maybe not cool, but we are likable. Yeah, um, I've, I've definitely, I've definitely at times reached the conclusion like I don't need anyone's approval. I'll be just fine. A lot happier that way. Though I'll tell you, though, I'll I tell think you, the cycle of adulthood is going back to that at least five times in a, a year. Though I'll say this: um, there's a comedian I like, Eliza. I think it's Schlesinger is her last name. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with her. Do you watch much stand-up comedy? Uh, a decent amount, but there's a ton of st- of stand-ups I don't know, so. Yeah. Well, check out Eliza Schlesinger. She's a, uh, a, a female comic who does a lot of stuff on sort of the silliness of single women kind of a thing, though she's mm-hmm. uh, ma- married now. But, like, she, coming up, a lot of her comedy was on what it is to be a single woman and sort of the, the silliness, the inherent silliness of, you know, in, in dating and whatnot. It's really, really funny stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, one of her bits, my wife and I have sort of taken on as her own. She does a thing where, you know, she talks about dating in your thirties. It's just like, you have to be a little bit more responsible. You have to, you know, take, you know, date outside your comfort zone. And so she talks about this one date where she went out with a kind of a boring guy. He was an accountant and he only had one drink and she's used to, um, one of the other bits she does is talking about her party goblin. So <laughs> she could, she couldn't, uh, let her party goblin out with this guy, which is sort of a bummer for her. But um, at the end of the date, which was kind of a meh date, she went to give the guy a kiss, and he, like, turned and I think, like, gave her his cheek or something like that. And so she does a whole funny thing about how she goes, like, down in flames. And she's like, I don't understand why he was rejecting me, you know? And she went into a side thing about what it means to be rejected by a guy. And then later on, she gets a text from the guy. She's like, I, you know, it's like, I would have liked to have kissed you, but I have to get up early. And she's like, that is the dumbest text I've ever received. It's so dumb, it doesn't deserve a rational response. So she sent him a, so she sent him a fried shrimp emoji. <laughs> Wait, the, the, I know there's a shrimp emoji. There's a fried shrimp emoji? Yeah, among, in the, yeah, at least the Apple phones. Amongst the food emojis, there's a, uh, there's a fried shrimp one. Next to the I sushi. Have, I have got to explore my emojis a little bit more often. Oh, my. I started to say, like, when I, my, my wife will send me stuff throughout the day. And after a while, I just don't know, like, don't know what to say to her. So at one point, I sent her the fried shrimp. After she had heard the bit, I sent her the fried shrimp. And she was like, oh, is that how it is? So she sent me a ball of yarn. Is this like when you started talking about time travel and it ended with you saying, I like cheese? Something along those lines. There um, you go. <laughs> so uh back to Eliza Schlesinger. What what fucking got me started on that? Um Oh, she does a whole bit. <laughs> I'm back, ladies and gentlemen. She did a bit about how, you know, she started talking about the the idea of the of the person who says, I don't care what people think of me. She's like, What do you mean you don't care what people think of you? What are you, psychotic? <laughs> like <laughs> And she talked about how, like, we all really do care what people think about us, or we would act insane. We would treat people horribly, and we, you know, and we would be, you know, we would be unable to live in in polite society. And I think she's, to a degree, she's right. You know, um, you know, I think it's, I think when we say like we don't care what people, you know, think of us, it's that to 
up to a certain point you're you're willing to do what makes you happy but you still are able to balance that with uh you know treatment of others not not a total i'm going to do whatever the hell i want to do and to hell with people which you mm-hmm. know, too, is too far to the one side of the pendulum so um i have no idea why i decided to bring that up though seahawk that's look thank you glad one of us remembered all right um switching to the other side here uh one of the things about this season one of the sort of b plots to it was uh, now that we spent the first season putting together the alliance now the alliance has to go forth and actually do something and there's 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 stress there's you know, you have Frosta who makes a point of saying, look, I've never had to deal with other people before. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you have Mermista and Perfuma, who there's some degree of tension between. And, you know, everyone kind of wants to do their own thing. Like, they may be, uni- they may be united in goal, but they're not necessarily united, um, you know, in a way that's productive. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of that going on in season two. Yeah, it kind of harkens back to uh, what was the line from Tony Stark? We're, it's like, we're a chemical mix. Oh, God, I'm trying to remember what that line is from the first Avengers movie. We've talked about it so much on this show, but I can never remember it. Well, there's Banner's line is, we're not a team, we're a time bomb. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a similar idea. It's like, they're all together. They know what they need to do. But that doesn't exactly mean that they're going to work well together. You right. can have similar goals to somebody, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be friends. Right. And well, I think it's there. I think they're all used to being the sole decision maker, the sole leader of their own domains. And now they have to work as a team. It's just not something that's coming naturally to anybody, including Glimmer and uh, inc- including uh, well, yeah. Bo's OK with it. But Glimmer, especially, I think she's really had to struggle with, you know, yeah, she she was the general basically of this army for so long that sharing power is not something that comes naturally to her. Definitely, I think Bo's also kind of coming into his own as the weapons guy, especially with Entrapta gone and him kind of realizing that he's got to step up his game to yeah. work on tech for the alliance. Um, so the the few episodes that kind of dealt with all of that, I uh, I did enjoy. We'll see where it takes us. I, I liked the uh, also the idea of okay, so they're out there and you know, they're fighting off these bots, but it's it's a war of attrition, and they can't seem to make any ground, which, mm-hmm. I, thought was an, which I thought was interesting to present in the first part of the season. I have to admit that there is something about that that you don't really see either side in season two get really far one way or another. I mean, season one. We had the great part after the princess prom where Glimmer and Bo are kidnapped and they've got she sword. And then you've got the ending battle where they take back the Whispering Woods. And this one, they're kind of, again, kind of at a stalemate. You know, you said it best. You don't really see the Horde or the Alliance make a great stride in one direction or another. Well, that's I, think I think the most we get is them recapturing that one city in the D&D episode and then... Uh, entrapped to getting that huge piece of first one's tech in the uh, the frozen north uh, episode. Well, that's the thing. I think you know we're we're not real. I, you know they may have called it season two, but I feel like this is more of the mid season finale. Like this is this is set up for the for the next seven episodes. Yeah, maybe that's why it feels so unambitious and cut so short. Is maybe. They really did. Maybe there was more that, that we were going to get, and they cut it short. I was thinking suspicion. There's at least three more episodes that they were building up before DreamWorks or Netflix or whoever the head honcho here said, "Oh, we're only doing up to episode eight. Yeah. Um, all right. I've um, I've covered a lot of territory here. I mean, granted, I, I don't. This isn't going to be a three-hour show. There's only seven twenty-two minute episodes here. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to you. Is there anything we haven't covered here that you want to chat about? Any uh, themes or issues that we haven't discussed? Any gr- any other side tangents I can go on for you? Well, this is kind of interesting for me. When Going back to when we talked about season one, 
I put money down that we were going to be hearing more about Eternia and we were going to be opening the doors for He-Man to come in, especially since we still know nothing about where Adora came from. She's an orphan. And at the end of the of second season, uh, you got Hordak talking about portals to another, other worlds. Well, when I first heard that, I thought, boom, this is how we're going to open up the door to Eternia. Eternia is not another dimension. It's another planet. And they're going to open it up, the portals to going there, and we're going to find out more about that. But now we got the news. We were talking about this earlier that there is a live action He-Man movie in the works uh, starring some actor from a Netflix movie whom I have absolutely no idea about anything else he's in. <laughs> I, I just love all the news. It's like He-Man cast so-and-so in role. I'm like, oh, that's great. Who the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I mean, we'll see. I, I've I've learned not to judge things before I see them. But I'm not utterly impressed with who they cast as He-Man at the moment. Better than Dolph Lundgren again. Mm, bite your tongue. Oh, no, no, no. I'll insult Dolph Lundgren until the day is long. I will not insult Frank Langella as Skeletor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Every actor deserves a role where they can act batshit crazy as a villain. We saw that with Frank Langella at, in Skeletor. Glenn Close as Cruella de Vil. I just, I'm sorry. I love it when I see a well-known, really amazing actor clearly going balls to the wall insane as a bad guy. I think next December, December 2020, we're actually getting a Cruella movie. We are. Emma Stone. I don't know where they're going with that. Live action Cruella. Get ready. I'll be tapping you for it. They try to give an origin for why she's got half black and half white hair. (laughs) So I'll help you. Hang on. There's a quote here that I've been saving. Where was that thing from? Somebody made a joke about... Yeah, here it is. Bad writing trope that's officially called midichlorian magic, where adaptations slash sequels slash reboots try to explain things that don't need explaining. <laughs> okay. And he brought it up because he was ta- he went to go see the Dumbo movie and was discussing how they literalized the pink elephant scene. Yeah. And it's like, you don't need to do that. Why would, so I like that idea, the midichlorian magic. And, I lo- and I'm just like, this needs to become a common phrase now for when they do this shit. All right. Well, we'll, we'll try to make that happen for you. Um, go watch Todd in the Shadows. He's the one who came up with it. It's a tweet that he did that I stole <laughs> or retweeted, whatever. <laughs> That's I'm. Hey, look, I'm all about stealing other people's stuff. Yeah, if you don't want it stolen, don't tweet it. That's right. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, going back, I don't, again, that part that we were going, but if we've got the live-action He-Man movie coming out, they're probably not going to want to do He-Man in the animated version as well. I mean, I don't know if these two are owned by separate companies right now, but either way, it would be a huge conflict, especially if, if you know, it's this the animated He-Man looks different and sounds different from what they're going with in the movie. My understanding is they're both uh, they're both Mattel, um, so I'm guessing if they wanted to if they if they wanted to put He-Man, see, I think you're right though. I think with the movie coming out, they're probably going to keep He-Man as far away from this as possible. But clearly, Hordak's plan has something to do with, you know, creating portals and moving things from planet to planet. Uh, so they don't necessarily have to deal with deal in with uh, He Man. But I'm wondering what else Mattel's got a hold of that they could introduce into this universe. There still are a ton of Shira characters that haven't been introduced into the series yet. Um. I hate to, I'm go, oh my god, I'm going to sound like so freaking stupid for saying this, but the only one, I know there's a ton, but the one that always comes back into my mind was a character from the 1980s version called Pika Blue. <laughs> what? She had these peacock feathers, and she could use them to, like, look far distances. I, I kind of like the whole give me sight beyond sight thing, and I don't know why, but she's always... You, you ever watched something when you were a kid and there was a really stupid part of it that just stuck in your brain? You have no idea why, but it's just got that little faction of brain cells in the back of your head and it's never frickin' left. <laughs> That's Pika Blue. Okay, then. Good grief. So, again, I know there's other characters that we haven't been introduced to yet, and I'm kind of wondering, do they live in... 
this same plan or are we going to see them brought it part of me is even wondering did they write that in planning to do he-man and then all of a sudden they announced they're doing the he-man movie i mean this obviously was put into production and worked on long before the announcement came about the he-man movie so i'm kind of wondering it's like did they start planning on doing that it's like oh crap we're gonna have to backtrack it, you know that's entirely possible is that the idea because i think at the time that this all got put into production um Mattel, uh, I don't think had actually had gr- had greenlit a Masters of the Universe movie just yet. So mm-hmm. they, you know, I don't remember when Sony lost the rights to it and how that and, and how that um, lines up with when this went into production because animation takes a while. So this oh, could have, oh. this could have been this, this could have been pretty far back before. Uh, uh, before things had to get switched around to accommodate the uh, the cartoon in the in the movie, so who knows? We you know there's too many variables here for us to really know. But well, I I do think that um, I think you're right. I think the big pl- I think the big plot and the big reveal and the, and the big finale is going to be Hordex going to get those portals working and something's going to come through that portal and you know and uh, it's going to mean you know serious uh, problems for Shira and crew. But I don't think we're going to see it interact with Shira until season four. You think they're going to do a season three will be fairly short, and then season four will be big bombastic again? Um, like I said, I don't know how many seasons Netflix is going to keep this around for. I mean, Voltron got up to I think season eight, and they definitely and you know and like I said, uh, there were a few seasons in between that they cut in half, so. Let me look and see real quick what the actual thing was. Uh, Voltron, Legendary Defender. Let's see here. Uh, come on, googly. Um, episodes. Uh, okay, so season uh, seasons one and two both had thirteen episodes. Season three was seven episodes. Seasons four and five were six episodes. Season six was seven episodes. And then the last two seasons went back to 13 again. Okay. So, we're, you know, like I said, we're probably get. It, I, I think they're keeping it the same. I think we're getting, you know, we're going to end up getting a, uh, a sixth, a six episodes at the end of this year. And they'll probably kind of keep it, you know, bounce it back and forth like that until we're done with this. It's my guess. Well, like I said, I, my theories for what they were going to do for the future episodes were shot when they announced the He-Man live-action movie. So I legit have no idea where they're going with this now. Well, you know, I, I like what you said about the, you know, the whole idea that uh, the, where we have a lot, you know, before we even get to He-Man, we still have tons more Shira characters that we can introduce here. Um, so... I think uh, I think it's too soon to tell, but I think we've got a lot of fun things on the horizon. How about that? Uh, well, if they can make Madame Roz work. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. Um, if that's uh, if that said, I think we're done here. We've been at this almost almost an hour now, so I think maybe uh, we'll move on to closing. Sounds good. All right. Um, this past week on uh, the Rattle and Broadcasting Network, we reviewed Battle Beast, No More Hollywood Endings. We did another TV party, this time for Cobra Kai Season 2. We did Secret Invasion on the source material next week. Uh, we got Civil War 2 in our in-depth discussion of race and gender swapping legend, uh, legacy characters. So if you enjoyed this conversation, you'll love next week's so- source material. Um, we've got a damn you Hollywood for Detective Pikachu. We've got our review of White Snake coming up, and uh, right after, I'm sure I, we have a teary goodbye from the Big Bang Theory. Then I gotta get my shit together to do an on trial with uh, Sean Comer as we do the Three Musketeers, the Disney version. We've got Blood Ties the week after that, and then a whole bunch of stuff with John Wick. We've got the Damn You Hollywood for John Wick Part Three. We've got the new Elavidi and a Long Road to Ruin for John Wick. We're going to talk some Zach Efron's Ted Bundy on TV Party tonight. Extremely, ugh, stupid calendar. 
uh, extremely wicked, shockingly, vo- shockingly evil and vile. I'll have Pat and Robert on for that. And then uh, just penciled into the tomb that is the tome that is the schedule. We've got a TV party tonight. We're going to review AEW, Double or Nothing, The Four Podsmen. If you liked our... Well, you haven't heard it yet. But if you like our Civil War show, it'll be the same four guys, myself, Jesse, and the two Chris's, two two of our many Chris's on, on this network, covering some uh, non-WWE wrestling for you. And then we end the month of May with World War Hulk, Aladdin, which, by the way, I saw a commercial for Aladdin tonight. And I'm okay with the movie as long as Will Smith isn't doing an impression of Robin Williams. And lo and behold, in the commercial that I saw, he does the itty bitty living space joke, and I'm like, "Oh no, don't do that. Be, be original with you know with this rehash material you're using. Don't do the same stupid jokes." I haven't actually seen that commercial yet. The most recent thing I saw was uh, Will Smith's appearance on Jimmy Fallon, in which they raced on magic carpet scooters through a little obstacle course, which was adorable (laughs) and yeah i said the same thing i said everyone kept complaining about will smith i'm like look i actually like the casting of will smith because i felt he could bring something original because again you try to do a robin williams impersonation you end up with even more watered down dan castellanetta yeah I just look, and, I, and I love dan castellanetta you know he gave it his all on the sequels and the tv series amazing voice actor but he is no Robin Williams. Yeah, I, I look. I'm okay. I was okay with the Aladdin remake as long as they took somewhat of an original spin on it. I mean, at least Be- Beauty and the Beast fleshed out some of the characters more. There was a little bit more story to it, even though some of it was a shot for, shot for shot remake um, of, a, of an animated feature. <laughs> but still, I I don't feel like they just wholesale ripped off performances from the animated feature. Don't fucking do it with Robin Williams. Poor guy. Poor, crazy, dead Robin Williams. Um, We've got a review of the new Sworn Enemy, and then you and I will be talking Game of Thrones. (laughs) It's been an interesting season so far. We have officially entered a world where we have an episode where a dragon gets a bolt through the neck and a long-lasting female character gets her head chopped off and what does the internet go crazy over? Someone left a coffee cup in the background. See, I th- that doesn't bother me nearly as much as the bitching and complaining about how they killed a black character and how Game of Thrones is unfair to its uh, women and uh, people of color. <sighs> yeah, because so many deaths previously, previously have been women and black people. Let's go back and count all the people who died in uh, Battle of Winterfell. And the Battle of the Bastards. And the Red Wedding. Uh, yeah, I, I've had, I, I have a lot of friends who say they won't watch Game of Thrones anymore. They say, it's too violent, it's too rapey, it's too, it's like, I, I just sit there and go, you're not going to please everyone. Yeah, there's some really, really horrible things on that show, but at the same time, it's fiction, it's another world, this isn't real life. I don't care. So listen to Alexis Hannah and I talk for 20 minutes about this season of Game of Thrones, another 10 minutes about the previous seasons, and then the rest of the hour yelling at the internet. <laughs> Isn't that what we pretty much do on every episode? You said it, sister. Um, and then finally, on June 1st, myself and Pat Mullen will be uh, doing boxing commentary for Anthony Joshua, the only real heavyweight boxer in the world. Versus Andy Ruiz Jr. on the zone, the zone. It's like a cow zone, but it's not. You know, I want to issue a challenge to our listeners, by the way, because yes, I will be on next week to discuss Detective Pikachu on Damn You Hollywood. Listen, guys, if you for in the in the movie Detective Pikachu, every character has a designated Pokemon as their partner. We want to hear from you. You listen to us week after week. You know, those we haven't completely driven off by our annoyances yet. <laughs> we want to know... You call them annoyances, I call them charms. Sure, why not? <laughs> we want to know, 
if you had to assign a Pokemon to the staff members here at the Rattledge Broadcasting Network, which one, which Pokemon would you assign to whom? We want honest answers. Uh, yes, that that that, that won't end in disaster at all. All right, uh, go ahead, quick plug, uh, plug your stuff, and then we'll get on out of here. Honeysuckle Rose Creations, the intersection of Geek and Cheek. We're currently doing a big month-long sale here in May. 15% off of everything in our Etsy and handmade at Amazon stores. Perfect gifts for, well, I guess a little late to ship out for Mother's Day. But hey, Father's Day is still around the corner. We do have a lot of stuff for the geeky dads. So go ahead and give us a look. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Again, we have our stores on Etsy and handmade at Amazon. Honeysuckle Rose Creations. All right. Uh, that wraps it up for this TV party tonight. And uh, we hope to offend you sometime in the future. Summertime tips and fun facts from Paul, Kristen, and Dexter at Total Wine & More. If you're topping off your burger with grilled onions and blue cheese, pair your work of art with a spicy Malbec. Nothing beats a buttery Chardonnay with grilled corn on the cob. I'm ready to find you the perfect bottle of white for your next get-together. Pack up the cooler for this weekend. We've got canned wine and beer ready to throw on ice. Whether you're hosting or just bringing the wine, Total Wine & More has you covered with 8,000 wines, 3,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers at always low prices. Cheers! Summertime tips and fun facts from Paul, Kristen, and Dexter at Total Wine & More. If you're topping off your burger with grilled onions and blue cheese, pair your work of art with a spicy Malbec. Nothing beats a buttery Chardonnay with grilled corn on the cob. I'm ready to find you the perfect bottle of white for your next get-together. Pack up the cooler for this weekend. We've got canned wine and beer ready to throw on ice. Whether you're hosting or just bringing the wine, Total Wine & More has you covered with 8,000 wines, 3,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers at always low prices. Cheers! <laughs> 